strains, which increasingly India has been overwhelmed with refugees. There are now over 7 million of them living in camps close to the border. Here, on the outskirts of Calcutta, in a swamp originally set aside by the government to cater to the city's overspill, is the biggest of them all, Salt Lake City. If the refugees continue to cross the border at their present rate of 40,000 a day, in three months' time, one-seventh of East Pakistan's entire population will be living in India. Not surprisingly, many Indian voices are now calling for the border. See the Indian seal. government seal the border Gupta, so that it, the State problem you now border. have, you can catch up with and cope with. Well, again, this is a matter of high policy. We never invited these people to come to India. When they started coming in, it was a question of humanity. They were running away from bullets, and surely they could not be stopped by bullets at this end. As you know, they speak the Bengali language, and the Bengalis of this side of the border are terribly sympathetic. Moreover, it is a huge border, practically 1,300 miles. The logistics of sealing the border are immense, immense problems. And uh, I do not think anybody can lightly think of sealing the border without at the same time taking the decision to kill off quite a lot, lot of people. To try and come across. That's right. Are you optimistic about the next few months? Because the problems are immense, aren't they? Well, I am not very optimistic. At the same time, I'm not also very pessimistic. You see, during the last 22 years, we have seen refugees coming into India. They do dislocate our development programs. Already we're a poor country. Just at the present moment, in half the districts of Bengal, there is no development work. The entire administration is geared only to look after the evacuees. Actually, I'm sure we'll lose practically the whole of the annual program. Development program. Annual development program this year. So this is a setback. From that point of view, we are not very happy. At the same time, as I said, we have, uh, so to say, surmounted this difficulty for the last 22 years. And I'm sure we can surmount this this time also. In the more established camps, these problems are lessened because some sense of order now prevails. The chaos of the early days has gone, cholera has been checked, and the routines of daily life are now strongly established. Most of the inhabitants of the camps come from small villages in East Pakistan and have never been part of the
One result of the refugee's ability to assist is the development of a rudimentary market economy in the camp. The more enterprising Bengalis have set themselves up in business. One man sells cigarettes, one of the bank grows the edge of the stock, another deal in His range of produce expands with every passing day. And even a haircut can be had for ten pices or two cigarettes. But Mr. Sengupta doesn't agree. No, the point is the camps are never substitute for one's own private homes. The community living in camps are never attractive to people who are used to having their own private means of livelihood. It is like living in a jail. Even if a man uh, gets food and shelter inside a jail, he wants his own liberty to go out again, live his own life. These camps are being segregated from the local population. We regard them as the inmates, as foreigners. We do not want them to get uh, assimilated in the locality. So they have great difficulties. They are all in living this kind of community life under the same tarpaulin. And I'm sure if you give them the facilities to go back, they will go back. For the vast majority of refugees, any thought of returning home in present circumstances is unthinkable. Living in conditions like these may be degrading, but in the refugees' eyes, it's far better than the physical persecution which they believe they'll suffer at the hands of the Pakistan army if they go back. President Yaya Quite what you've said about amnesty and the replacement camps. Apparently the refugees in Indian camps still refuse to return home. They're still afraid of you and still afraid of the army. Why? My message of amnesty and my uh, message of asking them to come home has not been conveyed to them. First. Second. My borders are troubled, not by me, but by my neighbor, shelling by field guns, mortaring by mortars, activities by infiltrators, armed infiltrators across the border are continuing. I uh, would like to know which displaced person, civilian, would like to cross that border under those conditions. But you say that the amnesty... Conflicting claims by the refugees and the Pakistan government have made any objective assessment of the present situation in East Pakistan difficult to obtain. In the capital, Dhaka, life seems to be returning to normal, even though half the city's population is reported to have fled. The city still bears plenty of scars from the bitter fighting at the start of the civil war four months ago. In some areas, whole rows of houses have been destroyed. Now people are beginning to be <laughs> It's a fairly easy job to restore the bricks and mortar, but it's going to be a lot more difficult to reconstruct the political edifice of East Pakistan. 
Mr. Butter, you described the talks you've had this weekend with the president as highly significant. Just how is most prominent politician? We asked him if he thought the two halves of Pakistan could ever be unified again after all that had happened. Yes, I do, and that's not because I'm an optimist. I really am a pessimist, because a politician must look on the darker side of things to really get to the better side of uh, life. And sometimes, for the sake of form, one has to appear to be an optimist. Uh, and in press conferences, one sometimes has to appear to be optimistic. I nevertheless feel that there is hope for the future, but this hope is dwindling. At the same time, I'll be frank with you. That's why time is so important. Sorry, what do you mean dwindling? Is dwindling there in the sense that unless there is communications between the people and the government, you will not be able to find a political rehabilitation. That can only come once there is a restoration of a dialogue. That can only come by a political regime, by civilians, those who have been charged with the people to look after their affairs, those who, in whom the people repose confidence those who do not carry a gun in their hands. Well, how long do you give it then? Well, I can't say that, but I say time is not moving in our favor because the political approach, the political orientation has not yet come into play. I want that political orientation to come into play as soon as possible, and I believe as of today, if that comes into being, we can arrest the deterioration and put things right. Is this a warning to the military government? No, how can I warn? I don't care. No, as a politician, are you warning that unless things are put straight soon, well, worse things could happen? I've already said that by November we will be uh, either on the rails or we'll be completely off the rails. Your modesty appreciated. There is still a, a scarcity of politicians who are willing to do the job and who are available to do it now that the Awami League has been disbanded. Well, available, I wouldn't say that because there are so many politicians. We've had too many of them. But uh, I would say that your observations apply to the elite as a whole, not only to politicians. Unfortunately, and I don't use this word elite in its uh, bourgeois sense or in its snobbish sense, in every country there is an elite. And unfortunately, we haven't really developed that in Pakistan for a variety of reasons. You mean there are not enough people to provide a civil government? No, 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 no. I don't mean that. Because civilians have not ruled the country for very long in the past. Bureaucrats have, and now the military is ruling the government. And the military has been associated with the government for the last 13 years in one form or the other. But I'm talking about the general elite in its academic sense. The intellectuals, the uh, people who think, the people who work, the creative people, they uh, who are concerned with men and matters, who are concerned with running of affairs, either in business, commerce, industry, politics, economics, that sense. Just how anxious do you think the army is to hand over power? Well, I don't know whether people in power, whether they are military men or civilians, are anxious to hand over power as such. But I think the compulsion of events is moving in imperceptibly for a return to political orientation. At the general election last year, Sheikh Mujib won the overwhelming support in the eastern province. He's likely to be put on trial soon and as likely to be executed for treason. Who could take his place in the east? You know, there is no such thing as a political void and uh, that doesn't exist either in terms of uh, particular personalities or in terms of even issues. Uh, I give an example. They say when the British leave the Persian Gulf, there'll be a void. There won't be a void. There never is a void. People step in, ideas step in, and uh, the events move on. So from that point of view, uh, I don't think that there'll be a problem. However, this doesn't mean that I am anxious for uh, his execution or I want his execution. I want justice. I would like justice to be seen. If justice is on his side, I will rejoice if he is uh, exonerated. Do you think he will be executed? But if justice is not on his side, then justice must be done. Will he be executed, do you think? I To the elected people, I am. Um, I also, after he got his mandate from his people, he and a, a coterie of his people around him 
deviated from that aim that they had promised their people and wanted secession. In other words, Sheikh Mujib Rahman has committed acts of treason, acts of open rebellion, inciting armed rebellion against the state. And being a citizen of Pakistan, he shall be dealt with according to law of Pakistan. Members of the Awami League in exile in India have warned that if the sheikh is executed, a wave of vengeance will sweep through East Bengal, bringing carnage that would make the civil war seem little more than a skirmish. If that were to happen, the Indian government might feel bound to intervene, and India and Pakistan would be at war. I'm not, I'm not looking for war. I'm trying to avert it by showing a lot of patience. But there is a limit to our patience too. So we are very close to it. That prevailing today in the subcontinent are very uh, volatile, they are very uh, explosive, they are very dangerous. I think it is uh, basically due to a great amount of patience that I am showing and my government is showing that we are not at war already. But uh, I hope to God the war doesn't come because it's not going to suit us, not going to suit the Indians. It's not going to suit anybody. So I'll persistently try to avoid war. But again, as I told you before, I, 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 I'm equally going to be very, make it very clear that if war is forced on us uh, through a means of some action in East Pakistan, an attack on East Pakistan is an attack on Pakistan as a whole. And there shall be war then. And I don't think I, uh, I can, uh, I'll be doing my duty to the nation if I uh, don't fight it out. But then I must say. In the last few weeks, the streets of Delhi have continually echoed to the clamor of demonstrations. In this one, hundreds of young nationalists protested outside the American embassy against U.S. arms shipments to Pakistan, so emphasizing the point that a war between India and Pakistan could easily escalate into a wider conflict involving the great powers. The United States has refused to block shipments of military equipment purchased by Pakistan before the civil war last March, and the result has been to reduce American relations with India to their lowest point in decades. But India and Pakistan have claimed they wouldn't fight alone in any war between them. And the fear is that both China and the Soviet Union would be drawn into the conflict on opposing sides. The Soviet Foreign Minister, Mr. Gromyko, hurried into Delhi last week to sign a treaty of peace and friendship and cooperation with the Indian government. The treaty includes a crucial defense clause that binds the parties to consultations and joint effective measures in the event of either side being attacked. There are several ways of assessing the treaty's importance. For Mrs. Gandhi, it can be seen as an insurance policy against the possibility of Chinese intervention on Pakistan's side should war break out. For the Russians, the treaty marks the culmination of years of patient diplomacy aimed at increasing their influence in the Indian subcontinent. But Moscow isn't anxious to get directly involved in any fighting between India and Pakistan. Indeed, the Russians view the increasingly bellicose public opinion in India as a dangerous development. They see the treaty, therefore, as vital support for Mrs. Gandhi against these pressures and as a means of urging restraint upon her. Whether it actually works out like that remains to be seen.